Yeah, good evening, everyone. So welcome back and uh, see how we get on this evening. So as Sabaya said, I don't expect you to believe everything I say. But the uh, main thing is, it's something to, um, to think about and to, you know, go away, do your own research and come to your own conclusions. And uh, this is the way in which I've been thinking about things for many years. So anyway, I'll just start, I'll open my screen. So I was looking there a little bit uh, yesterday. Uh, it's hard to sort of find a label which adequately describes the different cultural streams that are going on in Europe. Um, I've always thought there have been, you know, obviously one of the major ones that comes from Greece, then through Rome. Uh, another one is the Germanic tribes. I could also, I guess, include the Scandinavians there. A similar kind of yeah, mythology, you might say. And of course, there's a contribution from um, the biblical Judeo-Christian tradition as well. I'm trying to figure these things out. So the principle in it, as you know, in the last 400 years, it distinguishes between two different kinds of uh, streams that have developed within European history, especially since the Enlightenment. But as I've shown you in previous lectures, they go way back before the Enlightenment. So you could say the able-type democracy, which is... Um, in terms of worldview, in terms of roots, is very much in uh, Judeo-Christian tradition. As I explained in um, other lectures, you could say it's Hebraic. And then it talks about the Cain-type democracy, which you could say is pagan. It has its roots in Hellenism. And what I was talking about um, a couple of days ago, I think, in terms of how things developed in Rome and um, this kind of route. And so this has been... It's not only the principles makes this distinction, the able type and cane type democracy. It's something other scholars, a distinction other scholars in the 20th century also made. Two very interesting ones here. One is called J.L. Talmon. He made this distinction between a liberal democracy and totalitarian democracy. They explain there's a straight line from the French Revolution to what happened in Bolshevik Revolution and communism. A straight line from a totalitarian democracy from the French Revolution. As I explained before, the roots of this whole stream of collectivism, et cetera, et cetera, go back a long, long way to actually all the way to the Greeks and even and, and to Plato and the words he put into Socrates' mouth about the state being the flywheel of our life, and which is inherently totalitarian. Whereas the uh, Judeo-Christian tradition is inherently liberal because one of the main values here, of course, is freedom which again goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. God gave Adam and Eve a choice, eat the fruit or don't eat it. They had to choose. Um, so again, here in terms of economics, you get the free market tradition, here you get a socialist uh, tradition, public ownership of property, uh, state ownership of property, or at least a heavily regulated uh, market and a heavily regulated and controlled economy and the state involvement in all kinds of aspects of, of social life and civic life. Uh, another great scholar called uh, Frederick Hayek, he is from Austria, and he was given the Founders Award by our true parents and also a Nobel Prize winner. So he made the distinction between what he called Anglican liberty, which is liberty which grew up in the Anglo-Saxon world, uh, which is obviously where what we call the able type democracy developed, liberal democratic, and he talked about Gallic liberty, which is um, obviously Gallic means French. And again, the sort of very different understanding of the meaning of the word freedom or liberty, which exists in France and uh, anyway, culminated in that. These books are well worth reading if you have the time or the interest. I read them, I read them in the mid 1980s, haven't read them again since. So honestly, I've forgotten most of what I've read. But anyway, they're well worth reading. Uh, Talmud, Origins of Totalitarian Democracy, and Frederick Hyatt. One book is The Constitution of Liberty. Uh, first half's worth reading, the second half isn't, it's very dated now. And then Law, Legislation, Liberty, which is um, his serious book, and it's uh, extraordinary. And if you want to know what the principle would look like in terms of its social, economic, and political outworkings, I would think this book here, Law, Legislation, Liberty, is the closest I've ever come across. I said he was given the Founders Award by our true parents because he was a plenary speaker at, uh, I think, at least two ICASs in the 1980s, I guess. Okay, so from these two different streams within the European tradition came different visions about how Europe should be after the war. Um, this is how Western Europe should be after the war. Of course, 
the, the other big division was how uh, Europe should be after the war and the Soviets had their vision of uh, the world should be communist, uh, one party state, et cetera, et cetera, which I think I've talked about before uh, after the end of the Second World War. And then uh, in Western Europe, there's also different ways of trying to think what should, what should come. So Churchill, 1943, he was musing about this, thinking about it. When we win the war, obviously at that stage in the depths of you know, fighting, thinking about the future. OK, we need to think about the future. What's going to come after the war? So he postulated the idea of a United States of Europe. Because everybody basically, most people anyway, wanted to think, well, how can we create structures uh, within Europe uh, that will prevent another war like this happening, another devastating war like happened in the First World War, now the Second World War. And so, um, so based upon that vision that Churchill had, there's something called the, the Treaty of London was signed. Significantly, it was in London, and it's very Anglo-Saxon in that sense, 1949. The 12 founding states, all the states basically in uh, Western Europe, and it was intergovernmental. So that meant that different representatives and different governments that they would meet uh, together. And the basic values were democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. And uh, came up with that's the origin then of the uh, European Convention on Human Rights, obviously because of the uh, shattering experience of the, the, the war. Uh, what happened to the Jews in particular, the refugee crisis after the war, which I talked about yesterday. Because of all these things that took place, then they thought, how, what, what, what kind of basic rules do we need that everybody, every country that joins the Council of Europe is going to uphold? And so they developed what's called anyway, the European Convention on Human Rights. And personally, I, there's no philosophical basis to it be honest, human rights, no philosophical basis at all, just basic assertions. Anyway, but one interesting thing was that the European Court of Human Rights was established, whose rulings are binding on all 47 European nations. So that was really interesting. So that meant that uh, people from any of these 47 different European nations, if they felt they weren't being treated fairly within their own country, if their human rights weren't being observe, observed, then they could appeal beyond their own uh, highest national court to the European uh, Court of Human Rights. And the European Court of Human Rights, which had one representative from each of the uh, countries on it, these 47 countries, would uh, make a decision, and that would be binding. Uh, the reality is, to be honest, that this doesn't work very well. Some of the people who are, some of the, the representatives of different countries are not judges. They're not particularly um, qualified people to be able to act and rule in this kind of area. Uh, and uh, the European Court of Human Rights has become very interventionist and expanding the sort of very simple description of human rights that have been written in this document. They've sort of started expanding them uh, imperialistically. Anyway, even though Britain founded it, Britain will probably withdraw from the European Court of Human Rights in the next few years. Anyway, so Council of Europe members, this is the important point. Council of Europe member states maintain their sovereignty, but commit themselves through conventions and treaties or international law and cooperate on the basis of common values and common political decisions. So there's no overriding political authority in the Council of Europe. Mainly concern themselves with education, cultural matters, and these kinds of things. And it's based on cooperation, not having a supra level uh, of control. These are all the members of the Council of Europe. They expanded from those original 12 founding members. And then with the fall of the Berlin, the fall of the um, Berlin Wall and the Iron Curtain, all the countries in Eastern Europe joined as well. I'm not quite sure which country this is, maybe Serbia, I would guess. And even Switzerland's a member. No, not Switzerland's not a member of many things. Then another thing I wanted to look at was the origins of the European Union. The evolution of the European Union. How, where did that come from? How did that develop? So the first thing is to think about, look at is who is behind it. So one of the main people was someone called Jean Monnet, who's obviously French, a French entrepreneur, diplomat, administrator, and influential promoter of European Union from 1914. He's also um, deputy secretary general of the, of the League of Nations for several years, 
heavily involved in, as an internationalist in trying to promote um, international institutions um, and things like that. Um, and so he was also an advisor during the First World War uh, and suggested that it would be much easier to defeat Germany if Britain and France um, united their economies and worked together and coordinated their economies. Uh, and then he was also behind the idea <coughs> that uh, at the um, Paris Peace Conference, Versailles, after the war, then France uh, proposed establishing a new economic order in Europe. Again, to try to control the economy. If you have a very strong economy, it means you have the power to be able to build weapons and to start a war. If you don't have a strong economy, you can't uh, start a war, just the way it works. And uh, so the uh, French minister that proposed that, um, Jean Monnet was his assistant, basically you know, influenced that. So that's why Jean Monnet has been called the father of Europe, rather a pretentious title in my view. Um, but anyway, there you go. And they're very involved in establishing the European coal and steel community which I'll look at in a moment, which is a predecessor of today's European Union. So this is what he proposed doing. He proposed replacing the International Authority for the Ruhr. So after the First World War, an International Authority for the Ruhr was established because the Ruhr in Germany is the main industrial center uh, where a lot of op, um, coal was produced and iron and heavy industry. And so there was an International Authority to try to manage the Ruhr uh, so that this is after the First World War, similar thing happened there. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so, there's, so he proposed replacing this with an agreement to pool French and German coal and steel industries. So in 1950, the agreement of the Chancellor Konrad Adenauer of West Germany. So a very, very similar thing happened after the First World War, where that part of Germany again came under some kind of, I'm not quite sure how it was now, but then you know, Hitler moved into that area took over that area. So it's a very, very important, significant area for um, Germany and France and uh, industry. Anyway, so it came up with uh, this proposal, uh, Conrad, uh, a proposal from uh, Robert Schumann. Again, it was Monet basically drew it up, uh, made a declaration in the name of the French government. And uh, this landmark pronouncement prepared by Monet for Schumann, oh yeah, and was known as the Schumann Declaration, proposed integration of French and German coal and steel industries under a joint control of a high authority, open to other countries of Europe. Okay, so high authority, so this means this is a, an authority which stands above the French and German governments. It's an authority which is higher than the French and German governments uh, and is able to make decisions above what the French and German governments would like to make. So that was that. And then, so he said that through the consolidation of basic production, institution of a new high authority, whose decisions will bind France and Germany and other countries that join, this proposal represents the first concrete step towards a European Federation imperative for the preservation of peace. And that's from Wikipedia. So this was, the, this was his idea, how to promote and establish peace. So he thought the first way to do it, we can get the coal and steel industries coordinated and we can establish a high authority which has authority over the existing governments uh, which they have to follow. We'll come back to that in a moment. Who else is behind it? Now, somebody called Spinelli, who is Italian. He's an Italian communist, politician, political theorist, European Federalists referred to as one of the founding fathers of the European Union. So have a look a bit, a bit more at him. He was a communist and a militant anti-fascist in his youth. He spent 10 years imprisoned by the fascist regime in Italy. That's under Mussolini, obviously. Having grown disillusioned with Stalinism, the point is he was a Stalinist, you know, a hardline communist Stalinist. Anyway, he got disillusioned with Stalinism and he broke with the Italian Communist Party in 1937. Then he was interned, he was interned during World War II. And then he, along with fellow social democratic socialists and communists, he drafted the manifesto for a free and united Europe, most commonly known as the Vento Tenne Manifesto in 1941, 
considered a precursor of the European integration process. So there you have Jean Monnet working from the time of the First World War. Then in Italy you have Spinelli, who was a communist. And so a lot of, so even though he renounced Stalinism, it didn't mean he didn't remain a communist and a socialist, believing in the state control of society and the economy and the planned economy and all those different things. It's just he didn't like the way Stalin was going about it. That's all it was. And he didn't like the way that the Italian Communist Party was just switching its policies uh, from one side to the other, depending on what Stalin, what mood Stalin was in or what direction Stalin gave. Um, so, yeah, there were quite a few Italian communists in prison at that time as well. Okay, so he had a leading role in the fact, so again, this is important to understand the roots, the ideological roots of the European Union. He had a leading role in the foundation of the European Federalist Movement, had a strong influence on the first few decades of post-war, World War II European integration, in terms of providing the ideas and the direction and the kind of structures which should be adopted. Later, he helped to relaunch the integration process in the 1980s, which is when it slowed down. Then he was very much involved in that. By the time of his death, he'd been a member of the European Commission for six years, a member of the European Parliament for 10 years, right up until his death. And the main building, the European Parliament in Brussels, is named after him, a Stalinist. The 1987 to 88 academic year, the College of Europe, and the 2009, 2010 academic year, the European College of Parma were named in his honor. Again, this is just this basic facts from Wikipedia. So that, again, is one of the main founding fathers of the European Union. Now, if you look at the biographies of quite a few of them, you find many of them come from the socialist slash communist slash fascist background. They might wonder, well, I just mentioned fascist. Is there a Nazi link here? Well, very interesting, actually, if you look into the history. The Nazis set up a, ger a German geopolitical center in 1942 as a think tank to produce a long range strategy to take over Europe in the event that they would lose the war. And the ideas are set out in the, I'm not gonna to try to pronounce it, or European Economic Community, published in 1942 during a conference at the University of Berlin. So Germany then the thought, well, there's different aspects going on here. First of all, if they lose, how can they lose the war, but still establish control over Europe? That's why in the UK, the European Union has often been mocked as a, as a German a German outfit, basically. One, one way for Germany to rule the whole of Europe. Anyway, 1943 saw the first conference, the EEC, led by Joachim von Ribbentrop, who made the molotov von Ribbentrop pact with the Soviet Union, where 13 nations, not including Britain, obviously attended. So these are nations that have been conquered by Nazi Germany. And they thought that a united Europe would make Germany better able to combat the Soviet Union. So this is one of the reasons. Germany is involved in a life and death struggle with the Soviet Union. Uh, and it thought, well, instead of just making a Germany versus Soviet Union, if they could expand this to the whole of Europe, fighting against the Soviet Union, might be able to mobilize Europe in that way, make Germany better able to combat the Soviet Union. And one wonders, to be honest, if some of this anti-Russian legacy, which permeates uh, the EEC, European Union still around. You might think I'm making this up, but those of you who can read German, these are the documents, 1942. And the whole thing is outlined here. So incredibly important. This person here, Funk, I think he was the uh, leader of the, the, the German bank, Deutsche Bank or whatever at the time, the National Bank. And a lot of very important, very significant figures here. And if you go through, the, I can't read in German, but I've looked at it in English, and the, the basic titles here, you would think, wow, that's just the way the European Union is today. The basic outline of the way the European Union is today was outlined here by this group of German politicians and uh, academics in 1942. Okay, so let's go back here. So we've got these different kind of people involved. We've got Jean Monnet from France, uh, very much of a plan. And then you've got the uh, Stalinists, Spinelli, and you've got Nazis. These are the kind of people, the founding fathers of the European Union. I'm sorry if you, a lot of you are feeling very offended by this, but this is just the way it is. 
Okay, so the European Coal and Steel Community was established in 1951, which I mentioned as um, Monet, who became the first director of it. Oh yeah, with Monet as its head, which even then he explicitly hailed as a government of Europe. So he had this vision of creating a European government, a European executive, a European legislature, a European court, all the functions that were of a national state on a European level. And in the Treaty of Paris, he said, this was the beginnings of the government of Europe. So that was his plan. So initially it was treated with suspicion as a high authority with no, as the high authority had no oversight. It could just go around telling different countries what to do because it had authority above national governments. And so the new institutions were then brought in so that the European coal and steel community was overseen by four institutions. The high authority I mentioned before, composed of independent appointees. Interesting to look at their backgrounds. A common assembly composed of a national parliamentarians, a special council composed of national ministers and a court of justice. These would ultimately form the blueprint for today's European Commission, European Parliament, Council of the European Union and the European Court of Justice. All of what's now in the EU was contained in this document here. And the ES, ECSC stood as a model for the community set up after it by the Treaty of Rome in 1957, which was the um, European Economic Community, the European Atomic Energy Community, with whom it shared its membership and some institutions. And the 1967 merger treaty led all these institutions to merge into the European Economic Community. Now, you might think this is a bit interesting. Is it coal and steel community? Why for a coal and steel community do you need to have a high authority? Do you need to have a parliament? Do you need to have a court of justice? Do you need to have a legislature? Why do you need all of these just to administer coal and steel? It's, it's, it's a bit peculiar to be perfectly honest. The reason is because Establishing the European Coal and Steel Community, which is, a, which is a pretext for establishing the European Union. You had to start somewhere. So he thought, OK, well, let's start just managing steel and coal. We'll set up all the institutions there that we're going to need in the future. But you don't need all these institutions to manage the coal and steel industries. You don't need, an independent, you don't need separate laws, a court of justice, all these things. You can see there right in the very beginning. And so you might wonder why? Well, because uh, Manet first bid to move straight to the complete political union of its original six members. That's what he wanted to do. He already been thinking about this since the end of the First World War. It was rebuffed in 1954. Nobody wanted to do it. It's, you know, it's like too radical, too fast. So he and his allies realized they could only achieve their real goals step by step. So he deliberately decided to conceal it hide it by pretending they were only seeking to create a trading arrangement. But the Treaty of Rome in 1957 did begin by declaring their intention to work for an ever closer union and set up, uh, set up all the core institutions needed to run a future government of Europe, even though this was far more than was needed to administer what was sold as its headline purpose, just the creation of a common market. How much more these unnecessary institutions just to manage coal and steel. So they had already had this plan in the back of his mind, being very French, it's all planned out, all worked out in incredible detail. It just so happens, I don't know if there's any contact between uh, Monet and this group in Germany, or Spinelli, I need to look into that, but they all see overlap, right? overlapping ideas. And um, so it's all going on by stealth, secretly. You might say, call it a conspiracy if you like. So when, in 1961, so Britain then didn't join the European Union or didn't join the EEC when it was first founded the Treaty of Rome uh, for various reasons. Britain didn't see any need, didn't want to be under the rule of a, a supranational government, a European government. It had its own empire and commonwealth and everything else at that stage and uh, was, you know, couldn't see the need with joining with all these defeated bankrupt nations. But anyway, some years later, Britain first applied to join the six, 
Harold Macmillan, who was a prime minister at the time, and Edward Heath, who later became, who became the next prime minister, were fully briefed by Monet's allies as to the project's ultimate goal, full economic and political union. The papers but papers released under the 30-year rule, so when these government papers from 1961 were released 30 years later, they show that at the end of June, the cabinet, British government, accepted their urging that for presentational reasons, this should not be revealed to the public or parliament. British entry should be sold as being only to a common market, it's only just with trade and jobs. So that means that the British Prime Minister, Macmillan, and Edward Heath later, they lie to the British people, and they, pretend, they claim to the British people, this is only about free trade. It's got nothing to do with creating a European government, a European defence force, a European army, and any of these things, which they knew was, gonna, which they knew was the ultimate goal, because they've been told that by Monet and his allies. So anyway, for various reasons, um, Charles de Gaulle didn't want Britain to join, and he vetoed Britain's application because he wanted France to continue to model the EU or the EEC in the way he thought it ought to be before the Anglo-Saxons started to get involved. Here, when Heath applied for British entry in 1970, he perpetuated the same deception. His Europe minister was sent to plead with Brussels to keep quiet about its already emerging plans for a single currency, which is another idea from money. And it was said that British entry would involve no essential loss of sovereignty. A secret foreign office paper released 30 years later shows the government knew how important it was to hide, conceal just how untrue this was. So basically, in order to persuade Brit the British people to vote to join the European, the European Economic Community, the British government lied to the British people about what the, what the ultimate goal and aim was, what the ultimate goal and aim of the project was, which is to create a European super state. And the whole project has been based upon this kind of deception right from the very, very beginning. Step by step, it's expanded. Anyway, so it expanded a bit further. Single European Act in 1986 was sold as being only concerned with turning the common market into a single market. But in reality, the treaty was just what its title indicated, another major move towards a single Europe, giving Brussels control over several other important policy areas, little concern with trade. So there's a gradual imperialistic expansion here of the capabilities of the institutions of the European Union. 1992, the Maastricht Treaty on European Union was brought out into the open. The next instalment in the march towards the ultimate goal centered not just in full economic and monetary union, single currency, but including, including Monet's single currency, but also much else, never fully explained at the time, including moves towards giving Europe the new European Union, its own foreign and defense policies. So these are all things which are developing. European army and everything like that. So the, the EU already has its own embassies all over the world and gradually the national embassies will all around the world will all close because it will be administered just from the European embassy. The Constitution for Europe, you may remember this, was in 2005 rejected by French and Dutch voters. So in France and Holland, there was a Netherlands, there was a referendum and both countries, the Constitution for Europe was resoundingly rejected. Uh, Britain was, going to, was supposed to have a referendum as well, but uh, it was very clear it would be rejected in Britain as well, so it was, uh, they didn't have that. It was, the Maastricht Treaty is also rejected, I think, by Denmark. Uh, it's also rejected by Ireland. And so, anyway, so virtually the same document then smuggled back in as a more harmless sounding Lisbon Treaty in 2007, where there wasn't a referendum in France or Holland, but in Ireland, there had to be a referendum and Ireland rejected it, I think twice, but the European Union kept on telling them to vote again until they voted and got the right answer. Um, so formalizing the European Council, an official institution, the government of Europe. So that's the way in which the European Union has developed. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I, as, I'm sure you know I'm a Eurosceptic, I'm not a great fan of the European Union. Uh, but anyway, this is just the way in which it's developed. 
And so it started off here, these red countries, these original six, uh, Italy, France, uh, Luxembourg, Belgium, Holland, or Netherlands, Germany. And then uh, some years later, it expanded, UK and Ireland joined. And then after um, the fall of Franco and uh, Spain became a democracy, then Spain and Portugal both joined. And then uh, Greece joined. And then um, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, then things changed. And so Sweden and Finland both joined. And uh, Austria joined as well, which wasn't able to join up until then because of its situation. And then uh, uh, these countries here joined. And uh, can't see. yeah, so the Baltic countries joined Poland. Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, and then finally Romania and Bulgaria. I think they're pretty much the last. Oh yeah, and a couple of countries over here in, in the, the Balkans joined as well. Uh, I often call it, it's the donut state um, because Switzerland's not a member. And uh, it's very uncomfortable being in the middle of the European Union because the EU is trying to bully Switzerland into joining, but uh, Swiss uh, kept refusing to join because they have to have a vote. A referendum about joining. And so, um, anyway, so Switzerland has various deals together with uh, the EU, but the EU is, as I said, threatening and bullying Switzerland to conform to these, uh, to European law. Uh, Switzerland's a funny place, um, just full of mountains. You might wonder, well, who wants to live in the mountains? People who don't want to live in cities. People who want freedom. And uh, so the last, and so that's basically why Switzerland over and over again yeah, rejects joining any of the EU institutions, because to do so would mean to lose their freedom. They would no longer have the, the ability to vote on what laws they were going to have. Instead, they would all be imposed from Brussels. And that's the last thing the Swiss want. Um, and uh, yeah, they're funny people. Anyway, um, my spiritual mother, happens to be Swiss, Magdalena. She used to give me long lectures about the people that um, went to Switzerland. She said they were the people who wanted to, uh, who didn't like feudalism. They didn't like, they wanted to maintain their sexual purity. They wanted to go to the mountains where nobody could come along and rape them. And that's really, true. yeah, something in that. If you want to escape from the cities where all the organized crime is, where all the politicians are, and the alpha males are, and the terrible crimes take place against women in particular, the best thing to do is to go into the mountains where you can escape from all that sort of thing. So that's why Switzerland is the way that it is. Uh, it's a very interesting place. Anyway, this is the expansion of the EU. Another country it's not in is Norway because it would lose um, its uh, fishing. Anyway, the UK is no longer in um, the European Union. Iceland uh, is not in the European Union and is doing very nicely without being in. Uh, I mean, to be perfectly honest, the, the, the wealthiest, most prosperous countries in Europe are the ones that are outside the European Union. Switzerland, Norway, Iceland, and the uh, UK will probably end up there too. Okay, so that's that. Um, now what I want to look at, uh, you saw there the EU then, move, oh yeah, the European Free Trade Association. So Britain then, it didn't join the um, European Economic Community, and instead it set up an alternative uh, in Stockholm in 1960, so you call the European Free Trade Association. There were seven nations which weren't in the EEC, there's Austria, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, Portugal, Sweden, Switzerland, and the United Kingdom. It's very, very different. There were no, there were no and still are no supranational institutions. So it's just a trade, it's just a trading body promoting free trade, trying to get rid of customs duties on industrial products, but didn't affect agricultural fisheries products. So unlike the EU, which has its common agricultural policy, which is imposed upon all European states, irrespective of whether it fits their own particular um, agriculture and land and farming situation, also imposed on all uh, fisheries, common, common fisheries policy, which has been devastating for, uh, for the UK, uh, because British, yeah. Um, and then 
Anyway, most of the countries, though, they joined the EU. So only Iceland, Liechtenstein, Norway, Portugal, Sweden, and Switzerland remain in EFTA. Then, uh, yeah, so all the other countries join the EU. Then uh, this is how, these are the different, this is the complexity of European institutions. And you can see it's incredibly complicated. Uh, so this is uh, all the countries in the EU. These ones here. There's also something called EEA, which is kind of the rules of European Union rules on the economy, but you're not actually in the political aspect of the EU. There's EFTA, which is here. There's the Schengen area for free trade. Some all the EFTA countries are also in the Schengen area, but they're not in the EU. Um, it's also the Eurozone. Anyway, Britain, basic, Britain has left every single one of these institutions except the Council of Europe. And it's quite possible that Britain will leave the Council of Europe as well, because the infringement on, uh, Europe, or on British law by uh, the, the European Council on Human Rights. So Britain, the only thing Britain still has is a common travel area with Ireland, that's all. It's left all the other institutions. Well, still trying to leave some of them. It's the whole struggle now over the protocol in Northern Ireland. Okay, so let's have a look then, the end of the Cold War, which I looked at in previous lectures. One of the things the principle says, the peaceful restoration of Cain and Abel on a worldwide level, which is a great thing, there was no war. The restoration of the third blessing was possible. That was the privatization, establishing the free market, so it meant that people had the possibility of becoming owners and setting up their own businesses and owning land and farms and businesses and industries. Uh, the worldwide expansion of democracy into Eastern Europe and uh, beyond. Uh, breakup of the Soviet Union into its constituent parts. And as part of this, NATO and Russia agreed to be partners. I'm gonna look at this in a bit more detail. And also it resulted in the reunification of Germany. So as part of this whole thing, when the Soviet Union was basically going bankrupt and the economy is collapsing and the Gorbachev's uh, perestroika and uh, glasnost led to economic collapse. And when you have economic collapse, you have political collapse and you have military collapse. And then the whole thing became incredibly unstable. And so the question is, well, where do we go from here? Nobody except father expected that the communist world would collapse in 1988. When the Berlin Wall collapse fell down, everybody was shocked. It was completely unexpected. And people basically were having to make things up as they went along. The great thing is the world was blessed, or at least the Western world, yeah, the world was blessed by some very mature statesmen. Uh, uh, Reagan was not in here. Reagan, George Bush did okay. Cole, Thatcher, Mitterrand, Major. Uh, and Gorbachev and Shevardnadze and various people, incredibly mature statesmen. Anyway, so part of this then, well, when you, when you experience economic, political and military collapse, what you normally expect is your enemy is going to invade you. That's what normally you expect to happen. And so uh, during these talks between Gorbachev and Reagan, which I talked about in another workshop, then, Reagan said, you know, if you go through this whole process, we will not attack you. We will not take advantage of your weakness to invade you. And so this is a promise that Reagan made to Gorbachev in his private conversation talks they had in Iceland, Retrovic. And so Gorbachev then had to persuade his... Um, Gorbachev then had to persuade the people in the Politburo and the Russian uh, Soviet uh, parliament uh, to go along with this. Anyway, so what happened then is a Bush called Thatcher, Mitterrand, Major, they assured, they promised Gorbachev that NATO will not expand to the East. Now, if you want, if you, you know, people say that's not true, but all the documents are here, you can look them up. All the documents are there where they made these promises. They were verbal promises and verbal assurances. So this, for example, this is in 1990. The NATO Secretary General, who was a German at that time, Manfred Werner, said the principal task of the next decade would be to build a new European security structure to include the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact nations. 
the Soviet Union will have an important role to play in the construction of such a system. If you consider the current predicament of the Soviet Union, which has practically no allies left, then you can understand its justified wish not to be forced out of Europe. So at that time then, the Soviet Union, nobody expected the Soviet Union itself would collapse. You know, that was just not on the horizon, it just happened. Nobody's expecting it. But there's a sense, okay, we're gonna have peace, but part of this peace means that the Soviet Union then has to be integrated into Europe. Gorbachev himself talked about building a European house. There had to be some kind of structures that could, where the, Europe, where the Soviet Union could also participate in what was going on in Europe. And um, because the Soviet Union didn't want to be, didn't want to continue to be isolated from, from the rest of Europe. Because you know, Russians basically conceptualize themselves as Europeans, not Western Europeans, but they have a, a European culture, it's Christian, uh, not Catholic or Protestant, but Orthodox. All the literature is European, the music is European. Uh, basically, it's a European country in many, many ways, but just different. And then again, the following year, he said, he responded to the Russians by stating that he personally, and so Russia then had a lot of concerns, as I said, Soviet Union had a lot of concerns about what was going on. If they were gonna dismantle things and become weak, what was gonna happen? They didn't want, um, anyway, so he said per, that he personally and the NATO council are both against expansion. 13 out of 16 NATO members share this point of view. And we will speak against Poland and Romania's membership of NATO to these countries' leaders, as he's already done with the leaders of Hungary and Czechoslovakia. Werner emphasized we must, should not allow the isolation of the Soviet Union from the European community. So there's a strong determination in the early 90s by all NATO members, almost all NATO members, not to allow the countries of Eastern Europe that were in the Warsaw Pact to join NATO. And they actually rejected the application of these countries' uh, uh, you know, these, these countries' applications were actually rejected, even though they wanted to join. They said, no, it's not, we're not going to allow you to join. Made promises to Gorbachev. And then there's the Secretary of State. Uh, this, I have, there's so many quotes you can find of these significant political figures of the time saying these things. US Secretary of State James Baker assured the Soviet leader Michael Gorb Mikhail Gorbachev three times on February 9th, 1990, NATO will not expand one inch eastward because Gorbachev had to go back to the Politburo and assure the, and, and say to the Politburo, I have promises that NATO has committed that it will not take advantage of our weakness and it will not expand eastward up until our borders. Then Helmut Kohl assured Gorbachev the next day, there's a huge, a lot of conversations which going in, it's incredibly intense as things were changing so incredibly rapidly. And Gorbachev needed these kind of assurances to be able to persuade the Soviet leaders, the hardliners, to go along with what he was proposing, to trust him. So Helmut Kohl said, we believe that NATO should not expand the sphere of its activity. But new people come along and uh, things start changing. So instead of James Baker then was replaced a new election, new government, Chris, uh, new Secretary of State, Christopher comes along. So in 1993, the US charge of affairs in Moscow, he's based in the embassy, James Collins, who's in conversation with people in the Soviet Union in Moscow about what's going on. He said, just before his trip to meet Yeltsin in October, the NATO issue is neuralgic to the Russians. It's incredibly, incredibly sensitive. They expect to end up on the wrong side of a new division of Europe. They're, that's the concern of the Russians, that Europe becomes divided and they're on the wrong side of it. They're excluded, they're isolated again. If any decision is made quickly, no matter how nuanced, if NATO adopts a policy which, is, which envisions expansion into Central and Eastern Europe without holding the door open to Russia, will be universally interpreted in Moscow as directed against Russia and Russia alone, or as neo-containment. We're talking here 30 years ago, okay? And so what was proposed then was a partnership for peace to try to 
fine structures where the Soviet Union or later Russia then could be involved in lots of in the decision making within Europe. And uh, there were assurances that NATO would no longer, well, not no longer, but the military dimension of NATO would be de emphasized and other aspects of NATO would be emphasized. So it become much more of a, you know, a peaceful kind of body as opposed to a military body. Anyway, so declassified documents from the US and, and Russian archives show that US officials led Russian President Boris Yeltsin to believe in 1993, this is after the Soviet Union collapsed, that the Partnership for Peace was the alternative to NATO expansion rather than a precursor to it. While simultaneously, this is the deceptive part, planning for an expansion after Yeltsin's re-election bid in 1996. So the assurances and promises made to Gorbachev, then Americans and uh, Brussels went back on them. Why? Well, sometimes, you know, new leader comes along and you forget, you forget what was going on before. And telling the Russians repeatedly the future European security system would include, not exclude Russia. Yeah. So this is the idea of the partnership of peace. It would include Russia in this, this kind of peaceful kind of vision. The classified US account of one key conversation in 1993 shows Secretary of State Warren Christopher assuring Yeltsin in Moscow the partnership for peace was about including Russia together with all European countries and not creating a new membership list of just some European countries for NATO. And Yeltsin responding, this is genius. Half the problem was Yeltsin was drunk half the time, to be honest. So he didn't get what was really going on. A bit naive, really. In June 1994, Russia agreed to sign NATO's Partnership for Peace framework documents. And Russia then, it joined this Partnership for Peace. It, it came to the conclusion that actually it was genuine, it was sincere, and it would include Russia in the decision-making processes. And it wasn't a precursor to all these country, other countries joining NATO, which is the last thing that the Soviet Union wanted and Russia wanted. So the promises that were made to Gorbachev as the head of the Soviet Union, then Russia understood that these promises then were basically continued to be made to Russia as well. So from the time the Partnership of Peace concept was proposed in October 1993, the Russian government had to probe NATO's intentions, clarify its own ambitions and adjust its foreign policy to domestic political processes, this balancing act eventually succeeded. So a lot of conversations are going on here in terms of domestic political processes. Yeltsin, again, he had to persuade the Russian parliament. We can trust NATO, we can trust the West, we can trust Europe, that this partnership for peace is genuine. Right. So that was what was going on. So this is what the so the point here is, this is what Gorbachev, this is what Yeltsin, this is what the Russian people heard. Okay, there were lots of other formal written agreements about Russia respecting Ukraine, lots of other things like this, but this is the basically one of the aspects of what they heard. But then, if we look then what happened in the subsequent years after being members of the Partnership for Peace. Then 1999, Czech Republic, Hungary, and Poland joined NATO. Okay, there's none of them have a border with Russia. Poland has a border with Belarus, slight border with Russia and Kaliningrad. Then five years later, Bulgaria, Romania, Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, Slovakia, and Slovenia joined NATO. And of course, uh, the Baltic countries they have a direct uh, border with uh, with Russia, uh, but they're only tiddlers. Um, so not such a problem from a Russian point of view, but not happy. Then later, Albania and Croatia joined NATO. Then Montenegro. At this stage, Russia is getting really concerned. And Russia trying to uh, prevent Montenegro from joining NATO by stirring up a coup attempt or something like that. North Macedonia joined NATO. And then it's announced today, Finland is going to join NATO and Sweden. As a before, Finland and Sweden were both in, were both neutral, along with uh, Austria that's not in NATO or Switzerland that's not in NATO. So you can see here this expansion of NATO. So these are the original NATO countries, the ones in blue, dark blue. 
then uh, that was the 19, wherever it was. And then West Germany joined. It was a <coughs> realized the need of West Germany joining, and Turkey joined, Greece joined, and um, then uh, Spain joined, and then uh, which other countries joined? I think then after the fall of the Berlin Wall, then East Germany joined. And then you had these countries here joining Poland, Czech Republic, then Slovakia, Romania, Bulgaria, and these ones here and these ones here. Okay, so what's this big country here? That's Ukraine. So this is this is the thing. For Russians heard NATO is a defensive alliance and NATO will not expand but NATO has expanded right up to the borders of Russia. So from a Russian point of view, this is like shocking, uh, deeply shocking. Uh, not only betrayal promises, they feel militarily threatened and they feel incredibly isolated. And uh, to be perfectly honest, I understand why these countries wanted to join. It's obvious why they wanted to join because they wanted to escape from, you know, the Russian bear. They wanted to come under the, the American nuclear umbrella to protect them from ever being invaded and conquered by Russia ever again. If you remember this whole area here was part of the Russian empire, yeah, including Finland. So let's have a look and see, this then forms a background of what's going on now in the Ukraine. Okay, so one, oh yeah, so one very important thing that took place um, during the breakup of Yugoslavia, um, I need to come back to this. It's really important, and I didn't have enough time to go research it. So this is a little bit from my memory. Anyway, Kosovo is part of Serbia. Serbia is a, is a Slav country. It's an Orthodox country. It's, a, it's culturally, historically, very connected to Russia in many different ways, although it was never actually part of Russia. Uh, it was, on the, it was uh, part of the Ottoman Empire for a long period. When the Ottoman Empire retreated, Serbia became an independent country. It wanted to expand, and that's one of the things that sparked off the First World War, was the aspiration to have a greater Serbia. Uh, uh, but then in one part of Serbia called Kosovo, which is an historically very ancient part of, Kosovo, of Serbia, many Albanians moved in, emigrated and moved into Kosovo. And the Albanians that moved in there, as far as I know, mostly Muslims, and they're very high birth rate. And so, they basically became the majority population in this particular um, part of Serbia. And then the Serbians, when they became independent of Yugoslavia, they weren't too happy with this. And as far as I understand, it's quite a lot of persecution and uh, attempts at ethnic cleansing, uh, Kosovo of Albanians. A lot of ethnic cleansing went on all over Central and Eastern Europe and the Balkans most recently. And so the Kosovo and Albanians, and they said, declare Kosovo is going to be a republic and then declare Kosovo is going to become independent of Serbia. This led to wars, the Bosnian War, Kosovo Liberation Army. A lot of Islamist uh, jihadists joined that army. And then um, NATO and Russia became involved. Uh, for Russia, it was deeply shocking that um, the West took the side of Kosovo instead of the side of Serbia. Because Russians assume, well, Europe, America, they're Christian, therefore they should support Serbia and Serbia's claims over the claims of Kosovo Albanians, who are Muslims living in. Uh, but what happened in reality is that Kosovo was separated off from Serbia. It was, um, you know, it was historically always part of Serbia. But then the international community, United Nations, various things have passed, and so Kosovo then was separated, taken away from Serbia, uh, against Serbia's wishes, obviously. And so from a Russian point of view, this became an incredibly important precedent for taking Crimea away from Ukraine. And then NATO then got involved without working together with Russia. And again, that was very, very shocking. So Russians then felt deeply offended and humiliated by this. I can't remember all the details. So looking here at the background to what's going on today with um, Russia and Ukraine, as I said, there was certain kind of, you know, as we all remember, I'm sure from that time, there's an incredible amount of hope and optimism that the peaceful resolution was incredible. A 70 year struggle, really, uh, with communism, 
the Cold War managed to detain communism it's, for expanding too far and eventually it collapsed and the Soviet Union collapsed again unexpectedly. And there was a lot of hope there that you know this would be ushering in a new era of peace. And I think that was the genuine aspirations and thoughts and plans of the major participants at the time. People like Reagan, Bush, Thatcher, these, as uh, I said, they were all Gorbachev, Shev and Natsa, they were, and uh, Yeltsin, all very mature people, understood the way the world worked. Uh, but then the next, after you have elections, you get a new government, a new party comes along, and often have different policies to the preceding part government, and sometimes they forget, or they disagree with the policies of preceding government, and they just ignore them. And sometimes they're just ignorant about what came before just ignorant about what came before. And I think there's been a huge amount of ignorance uh, there uh, about, uh, you know, basically about the history. So let's have a look, let's not be too ignorant ourselves, have a little whiz through Slavic history. <clears throat> so there's the position of the Slavs in about the eighth century. There's a Slav, they're all tribes, there's no state. They're, they're tribes, the Baltic peoples, again, they're, they're tribes, they're settled there. The Finnic peoples, again, the tribes, there's no state. The Bulgars, the Magyars, you know, they're sort of moving around. There's the Khazar Federation here is quite well established. Down here, you have the Byzantine Empire, of course, which has been around for, um, well, it's, it's the heir to the, the Roman Empire. Uh, here you have Bulgaria, which is a very early uh, European state and very highly developed, very cultured one of the most significant uh, states in Europe at that time. And then, of course, you have uh, Islam down here, the Middle East and the Caliphate expanding into this area, threatening to take over Byzantium, so moving up from there and from there. So, okay, so that's where we are. I can't remember exactly when it was now. Is it 988, I think? Anyway, so now this is what's called Kievan Rus. And so these were the, the Slavic tribes, all this sort of area here. And then from Scandinavia came the, the Vikings. I've talked about this before, and I've talked about Russian history before. Anyway, they were always going, traveling by sea and by rivers, and they traveled down these huge rivers in, uh, and even attacked Constantinople. And then uh, one of the, the leaders there, someone called Rurik, he was invited to become the king, and he became a uh, ruler of the, of, of the Rus. And his capital was there in Kiev. And his name was uh, Rurik, the house of Rurik. And then one of, I think his grandson, or great grandson, I forget now, was someone called Vladimir. And he uh, decided that um, Russia should become Orthodox. And so Russia then adopted Orthodox Christianity from Constantinople. But you can see here, this is basically Kievan Rus. Yeah. And the main way in which things happened was traveled down the rivers. Up here, of course, the Baltics, which is frozen. And here's the Black Sea. Uh, but then the Mongol invasion took. So Kiev and Rus then was expanding. It was, uh, I'm not going to, I talked about Russian history before. But then the Mongols came along, Genghis Khan, all the people. Uh, this is their capital here in Karakorum. Uh, Mongol invasion swept across the steppes and uh, got as far as here, North European plain. This all became part of the Mongolian Empire also China as well. And it is vast, even when here it sacked Baghdad, and eventually Mongols became Muslim for various reasons. And so this whole area here of Russia, what's now modern Russia, was under the Mongols, except for a little area here uh, called Novgorod, uh, Republic, Republic of Novgorod, Novgorod the Great. And this transformed and changed hugely um, Russian mentality, and this whole area. So this whole area here, which is now called Ukraine, that also came under Tatar, Mongol domination, and went all the way down to here. And so when you look at people in Eastern Europe, you can often see in the complexion, uh, the descendants. So this there was Kiev and Rus. All this area here became under Mongol domination. Uh, this area here uh, was the only part that remained free, Novgorod. These are the, the Knights of the Sword, the Teutonic Knights. And when the Mongols came in and attacked uh, Russia, then the Catholic Teutonic Knights from the West decided it's a good opportunity to attack Russia. 
and they were defeated at the battle by um, Alexander Neff's. I can't remember who it was now. Yeah, they were defeated. Uh, but it was a big shock again for Russia, this attack from the West, just when they've been attacked from the East. And so this is, how, this is the extent of the, um, the Mongols, got as far as here. And this whole area here then. Uh, so Georgia is, uh, was one of the very first Christian kingdoms, and uh, Georgia and Armenia, very early Christian kingdoms. Um, now you can see the last, uh, you know, Byzantine, the Romans have got involved there as well. And this is Mus so then Kievan Rus then it fell to rush to the Mongols and then the Russians started to rebuild basically centered on Moscow it's called Muscovy very complicated reasons why now if you look this is Moscow here and it started to expand in this area here Novgorod this area here and gradually started expanding east and north and south but look at Moscow it's very close to the Polish Lithuanian border very close. So this whole area, which is now modern Russia, was part of that. This whole area here, which is now modern Ukraine, was part of Poland, Lithuania, uh, pretty much all of it. And um, if you look here, then Muscovy, where is its access to the sea? If you want access to the wider world, you want access to for trade and everything, you need to have access to the sea. So this then is a bit of a problem here. So they had access here, but this is the Union of Kalmar. That was uh, Scandinavia, Norway, Finland, and uh, Sweden, or um, I'm not quite sure who was in charge. But anyway, they were all somehow connected in a, in a single kind of state, I guess. The Teutonic Knights were here. And the Golden Horde, so this is the um, descendants of the Mongols. So when the Mongol Empire broke up, there were different hordes. This is... Uh, and the Khan was the person who's in charge. The Golden Horde is here. And uh, so even today, and there's another Khanate here, Kazan. And so even till today, this here's a Muslim Republic within Russia. And um, so this is the time of 1648. It's the time really of sort of Peter the Great. Sweden at that time was one of the mightiest uh, kingdoms within Europe. And you can see here, Russia then, even though it's expanding, to the north, to the east, and to the south, <clears throat> it doesn't have doesn't have access to the sea either the Baltics or the Black Sea. It's basically landlocked. So Kiev and Rus was landlocked. Now Muscovy, which is basically an, Russia's basic expansion of Moscow, to be honest, and um, all kinds of stuff goes along with that. And so Peter the Great he defeated the Swedes. Uh, in many battles, he fought them for many years, and eventually he defeated the Swedes. And as a result of that, then um, uh, Russia got access to the Baltic, the Baltic Sea, and that's why Peter the Great established St. Petersburg there. Uh, he moved the capital from Moscow, uh, which is still very close to Poland, not from moving from Moscow to St. Petersburg because it's a window on Europe, because he wanted to modernize Russia, which has not only been, if you're very, very landlocked, you're also culturally very isolated. And Russia is incredibly isolated at that time. And Peter the Great wanted Russia to break out of that cultural uh, economic isolation and to have the opportunity to get modernized and new ideas coming in. But Peter the Great, he said, it's imperative for Russia to have a warm seaport because the Baltics is frozen for a large part of the year. They also had access up here to Archangel, Archangel to the Arctic Sea, but of course that's frozen even more. So there's no warm seaport. And part of the pursuit of going east is to find a warm seaport. Eventually it's Vladivostok, which is also, you know, has a problem with ice, but it's a long way from Europe. So Peter the Great said, in order for Russia to become great, it's necessary to have a warm seaport down here, access to the Black Sea. And to the Black Sea, you can get access up these rivers here. This is the, um, the Danube River. <clears throat> and you've got access to uh, the Mediterranean. So in order for Russia to become great and to be able to communicate and interact with the rest of the world, it's necessary to have access to the Black Sea. At this time, it's all controlled by the Ottoman Empire. So the Mongols were retreating and the Ottoman Empire filled up this space, occupied a large part of Europe, almost uh, laid siege to, to Vienna twice in the 17th century. 
All this part here was also controlled by the Ottomans. And this, so anyway, lots of old names here, Circassians. Can't remember who they were now. There's another Carnate down here that was Bex. So that then became the sort of goal, moving to the south. And then under Catherine the Great, who came later, <coughs> Russia then was able to expand to the, to the south. And then Poland then was squeezed. You see the big difference here. Poland became trunk. So the Poles also Slavs. Uh, talked about once before, and uh, Russia also developed a long sea border here. It conquered uh, Estonia, Lithuania, uh, Latvia, and Estonia. Uh, Lithuania remained here, part of Poland, uh, and then also went south. And so Catherine the Great, she conquered this area here, which was then occupied by the, the, Cos the Cossacks, uh, and then the Crimea, and uh, moved down further south here as well. So establish a border here with a mountain border here, uh, which is secure. So that was the Russian Empire in the 18th century. And then it continued to expand, uh, again, moving west. <laughs> and you might wonder where's Poland gone? Well, it became part of Russia. And uh, according to an old friend of mine, uh, Who's Polish? He said the Russians said Poland doesn't exist, they're all Russians, really, because they're all Slavs. <coughs> Harkov, uh, no, uh, Krakow wasn't, uh, was just you know, not part of that, just over here. But Warsaw then became part of the Russian Empire, and uh, Lithuania was now Lithuania, so a huge expansion there. And also Finland then became part of the Russian Empire, this whole area up here. And again, expanding down here, <clears throat> the Ottomans getting pushed out, uh, moved further south into uh, Baku, that's the capital of uh, Azerbaijan. So there's some Muslim areas down here, uh, <clears throat> Yerevan, Armenia, uh, and Georgia, all became part of the Russian Empire, and also expanding here to Turkic people, Tashkent, um, well, there's Kazakhstan, and Turkmenistan, and Kazakhstan. There's different areas here, which again, they're all Mon part of the Mongol Empire. So the Mongolians then were pushed out. And the people carried on living there. This came under Russian rule. And so sometimes the Russians tried to force the Mon Muslims to convert and become real Russians and become Orthodox, uh, but it didn't work. And so eventually they tried to come to some kind of settlement there. So, so I said, this is 200 years ago, that was that. And then, this is basically the ethnic makeup of, well, what was then the, Union, the Soviet Union. Uh, this is a sort of different ethnic makeup. These green ones, this is, these are Russians, ethnically Russians. These ones here are Ukrainian, and all sorts of different Belarusians. And a lot of these people here, they're Turkic peoples. But Russia is an incredibly multi-ethnic, multi-religious, state, the Soviet Union was multi-ethnic and multi-religious, and uh, as it is until today. So the question is there, well, when, when uh, Russia was defeated in the First World War, and uh, the Tsar was overthrown, and uh, went communist, then the question is then, what are you going to do with this? So under Marxist theory then, empire is Imperialism is regards the highest stage of capitalism. So Russia was an empire. So if you're Marxist then, communist, you've taken over the Russian empire and you believe imperial, empire is the highest stage of capitalism, what are you going to do with this empire you've now taken control over, control of? And so, big problem. What are you gonna do? You're gonna maintain it as a Russian empire. <clears throat> and so St someone calls Joseph Stalin, I'm sure everyone's heard of, he was from Georgia, uh, Tbilisi, well, not from a little place outside Tbilisi. He was a Georgian. He's appointed to be the Bolshevik or Communist Commissar of Nationalities. So he was the one who had to try and solve this problem. What are we going to do with all these different nationalities and ethnic groups that exist within the Russian Empire? So he came up with a definition of nation. He said a nation is a historically constituted, stable community of people formed on the basis of a common language, common territory, economic life and psychological makeup manifested in the common culture. 
And to be perfectly honest, I think that's a very good definition of what a nation is. I can't really disagree with it. Um, anyway, so he, came, he was quite a thinker, theoretician. He wrote books on this and to try to solve this problem. And, uh, but anyway, some of, these na- some of these nations within the Russian Empire, <clears throat> they wanted to become independent. Uh, so the Ukraine, for example, it now wanted to become an independent um, nation, although it had never been an independent nation ever before in its history. But they were, a, they were a, a people, and they developed a sense of nationhood, particularly during the 19th century, and particularly when they're under Polish-Lithuanian rule, as opposed to Mongol rule. They developed all kinds of different institutions there, became more connected. Part of the Ukraine was under Polish rule, became connected with uh, Rome and the West, and had a new church, a unique church. Um, looking at Stefania here and thinking, I'm sure I'm making loads of horrendous mistakes in my recounting this history and making it up from my memory. But anyway, there you go. Anyway, uh, socialist communists took over in the Ukraine and uh, they wanted to make an independent state. So the people in Moscow then, they could see there's a possibility here of the fragmentation and breakup of, of the Russian Empire and into independent states. And so there's a you know, big issue here, what are we going to do? And so in the Ukraine, the Red Army was sent in. And so Ukraine was not able to become an independent communist state. Uh, instead, it became a Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. So all these republics became uh, like that. And so it created a union of Soviet Socialist Republics as a federal structure, and the, and the capital is in Moscow. So in that sense, Russia was broken up into its constituent parts, but each of these parts then became a Soviet Socialist Republic with their own capitals and a limited amount of independence because they're all part of this federal structure. And the boundaries changed over the years. And so, as I said, Stalin was in charge of the policy and he was thinking, what are we gonna do? You know, the vision, the communist vision was to make the whole world communist, not just the Soviet, not just Russia and the Soviet Union, but all the whole world should become communist. <clears throat> so basically, these are, his po- these are his four basic policies. One was centralization and conformity, which basically meant Russification. So even though he was Georgian, he decided that Russian culture and language were to bind the different nations together to create a single Soviet people. So they talked about new Soviet man. So they wanted to break down people's national identity so that people conceptualize themselves as a Soviet citizen their loyalty to the Soviet Union, not, and to break down their national sense of identity, because you realize this is going to lead to fragmentation. And so wanted people to think of themselves, conceptualize themselves as being Soviet citizens, and who would not only speak Russian, but also for all intents and purposes, be Russian. So that was the aspiration and goal, to make all these different nationalities and ethnic groups Russian. So native communist elites were purged and replaced with Russians or thoroughly Russified locals, you know, Russian-speaking locals who had a Russian mentality. And the native communists, even though they were communists, they were got rid of because they were native communists like Ukrainians who wanted to be independent, an independent Ukrainian communist state. And teaching like the Russian language was made compulsory in all schools. Centralized authority in Moscow was strengthened and self-governing powers of the republics was curtailed. So even though in theory, they were independent republics, but in reality, their governing powers and their independence was constrained and restricted. Nationalities were brutally suppressed by such means as the forced famine of the, uh, in the Ukrainian Republic. It's called the Holodomor. <coughs> so during the Soviet Union, there was the abolition of private property. So independent farmers, all their property, their land, their farms were confiscated. It was all collect, it was called collectivization. And so everything's run by a collective. But of course, when committees try to do anything, it's always a total and utter disaster. You know, try and imagine a committee running a factory, a committee running a farm, it was a disaster. And so throughout the whole of the Soviet Union, there was famine, there wasn't enough food. But in reality, you know, Ukraine is a breadbasket of Europe. 
there's vast amounts of food there. So in order to feed people, <clears throat> then the food was taken away. The grain was taken away from Ukrainian farmers who were labeled as kulaks, <clears throat> and they were brutally suppressed. And about 4 million people in Ukraine died of famine. Part of the motivation, part of the reason for this was Stalin wanted to break Ukrainian sense of national identity. So Ukrainian speakers in the Ukraine suffered more than Russian speakers in the Ukraine in terms of Stalin's policy to um, suppress them through this brutal famine, basically. Then the federal stru state structure was preserved, <clears throat> but support for nationalities and regional autonomy is drastically reduced. <clears throat> so two or more unrelated ethnic groups were often arbitrarily combined within a single ethnic territory to weaken secessionist aspirations. <clears throat> so Stalin thought, okay, if I combine, instead of having the borders around a particular ethnic group, let's combine two ethnic groups into a single republic and then speaking different languages. And then it's very hard for them to unite with each other and very hard for them to want to become independent because they're spending all their time arguing, fighting with each other. That was another one of his policies to draw on these kind of boundaries arbitrarily like that. <clears throat> so for example, this is, um, you know, Solzhenitsyn, for example, said, obviously one of the things Putin said that the border of Ukraine was, made by the, by the communists and a lot of Russian land were included. It's not just Putin who said that, but Solzhenitsyn said that as well. He said, many parts of the Ukraine are not Ukrainian. It's just that was where the border was drawn for, politi for political purposes and political reasons. Also Stalin divided ethnic groups with artificially drawn borders. <laughs> so instead of putting the whole of an ethnic group within the same Republic, you often divide the ethnic group. So half the ethnic group is in one republic and the other half in another republic. It's like divide and rule, basically. And then he deport, there's often another policy of deportation. So at seven ethnic groups were deported from the native territories en masse. So for example, the Crimea Tartars. So a lot of the, the, the people living in the Crimea, they were descendants of the Mongols, they call the Crimea Tartars. And so they were deported to Siberia along with a lot of Germans living around, settled somewhere, I can't remember where now in the South, were also deported Siberia, the Kalmyks were deported. Lots of groups were just rearranged. Very much the same policy as, uh, you know, the Syrians would have done in the, in the ancient world. Just uh, moving peoples around so you can rule over them and you can destroy their sense of identity by separating them from their language, separating them from their land, separating them from their community. In other words, he started to find very well what a nation is, but then all his policies were devised to break up and destroy nations, to create a new Soviet identity, the Soviet Union, a new Soviet man. <clears throat> so he was quite brilliant in an evil kind of way. So this is um, the USSR after the Civil War, 19 around right about 1920, this whole area here was lost, this, the, the Baltics were lost, Poland was lost. So after the First World War, all these parts here of the old Russian empire, <clears throat> they all became independent. <clears throat> and then all these parts here, they were left with in USSR. <clears throat> and as I said, um, you know, borders were drawn and the borders were moved from time to time drawn and redrawn and they were never really fixed for very long <clears throat> and this is how they were in the soviet union after the second world war <clears throat> when uh, most of the russian empire was re was reintegrated into <clears throat> ussr or the baltics were and various other parts here and these sort of basic borders that still exist up until today <clears throat> so uh, if we have a look at the crimea then as I said, the Crimea was conquered by Catherine the Great, became part of Russia for 200 years. And then when Ukraine became independent, <coughs> Crimea remained part, was part of Ukraine for about three years. <coughs> but then after that, Crimea was reallocated back to Russia and it was part of Russia from 1921 to 1954. <coughs> and if we look at the makeup of the Ukraine, this is the way it is. All these people, the red area here, these ethnic Ukrainians who speak Ukrainian, the language, 
they're mostly all Ukrainian speakers and ethnic Ukrainian. These ones here, predominantly U Ukrainian speakers. These ones here, people living in Ukraine, but they're mostly Russian speaking. So they may be ethnically Ukrainian, but speaking Russian. Uh, but also the significant ethnic Russian populations here, ethnic Russian speaking Russian. So it's ethnic Ukrainian speaking Russian and ethnic Russian speaking Russian. Very complicated. These ones, this area here is predominantly uh, Russian speaking, even though they're Ukrainian, ethnically Ukrainian. And uh, this area here, Crimea, as you can see, is <coughs> um, ethnically Russian, ethnically Russian and Russian speaking. So this part here is the part conquered by Catherine the Great, when the Crimea Tartans were expelled, then Russian speaking, ethnic Russians were settled here in the Crimea. So the Crimea is definitely very Russian. And then you've got different kind of groups over here, there were minorities here and there. So when you look at it, you can say, well, mm, Ukraine is not a, it's not a, it's not homogenous. It's a very divided country. And so all these areas here, the education has been, has been in, in Russian, Russian, Russian language schools. The education children have been receiving is Russian. Because the Russian speakers and Russians wanted to keep their language and their identity. Here, here obviously, the Ukrainian speakers. But during that time, there's a lot of resentment of Ukrainians towards Russia because of the Holodomor and because of the imposition of Russian language. So lots of very complicated things going on. That's, that's the ethnic makeup of Ukraine and the linguistic makeup of Ukraine, very, very complicated. Okay, in terms of the history of Crimea, then this is how it was or has been. It was part of the Byzantine Empire for a long time. So the Black Sea was a Byzantine Sea. Then the Mongols came along, as I talked about, and the Mongols conquered uh, this whole area here, became uh, part of up down to about here. You get the sense here, Bessarabia, lots of old names here. So basically, the Mongol Empire was up to about here, uh, and Crimea was part, of the, was part of the Mongol Empire. Then the decline of the Mongol Empire was break up, became part of the, became known as the Crimean Khanate. Uh, so again, it's uh, all Muslim. And then, as I said, the Russian Empire expanded further south. Catherine the Great conquered the Crimea and this whole area here, which she called New Russia uh, in 1783. So from 1783 to 1917, the Crimea then was part of Russia, as was this whole area here, part of the Russian Empire. This part here was called New Russia. This is the Donbass where all this fighting taking place. These are two cities here, Donetsk and Lugansk. And uh, the people living there are Russian. You might wonder, well, who started these cities? Well, it was two Welsh, two Welsh businessmen went from Wales. They went over here because you know, in, in Wales you do a lot of mining. So they went here <clears throat> and they developed and built up these two industrial cities. <clears throat> and then a lot, because a lot of, they needed people to work. So a lot of Russians then, they emigrated and they moved into this area here. Up until then, basically the sort of people called the Cossacks. They were very independent, free-spirited people, often rebelling against uh, Peter the Great, rebelling against uh, the uh, Russian rule. But anyway, a lot of Russians then moved into this area here uh, and then, as I said, Russian Empire, Crimea is part of Russia until 1917. Then from 1917 to 1921, it was part of Ukraine. <clears throat> and then when the borders are rearranged, uh, it was returned to, it reverted to Russia again. So from 1921 to 1954, it became part of Russia. During that time, Stalin deported all the Crimea Tatars and settled uh, Russian, ethnic Russian speakers here. And then um, in 1954, someone called Khrushchev, who was the Secretary General of the Soviet Union at that time, he was the one who um, initiated the de-Stalinization de of the Soviet Union. He exposed all the crimes of Stalin. He opened the gulags. And uh, one of the things that he did uh, was he uh, transferred the Crimea to, to the Ukraine. This was in memory of I think it's the 300th anniversary of some kind of treaty that was made between the Cossacks and the Russians. So in memory of that treaty, he gave Crimea to Ukraine. Khrushchev himself happened to be Ukrainian. 
Um, maybe there's stuff going on there with anyway, various things going on. And so from 1954 to 1991, uh, Crimea was part of the Ukraine. In reality, it made no real difference because they were all part of the Soviet Union. So it's just an administrative transfer of Crimea to Ukraine, but in practice, it made no difference at all. Now, Crimea is the major seaport for Russia. Sevastopol is here, somewhere around here. And um, that's where the uh, Russian Baltic fleet was always based. And then after the Soviet Union was established, that was a Soviet Black Sea fleet was based there. So it's a major port, not only for trade, but also a major military naval base. Uh, the only one which is, you know, free of, of, of ice. <clears throat> and then, um, so it remained part of Ukraine until 1991. In 1991, there was a breakup of the Soviet Union. Ukraine uh, held a referendum, and the referendum, they voted to become independent. And then Crimea at this stage was part of Ukraine. And so uh, Crimea continued to be part of Ukraine from independent Ukraine from 1991 to 2014. In 2014, um, Russia annexed, Ukraine, annexed the Crimea, okay? So let's try and figure out why that was. So why did Russia, why did Russia annex Crimea? <clears throat> so the first, well, the first reason is Crimea was part of Russia for 200 years. 200 years is a long time. You know, there aren't many countries in Europe which, whose borders haven't, there are no countries in Europe whose borders haven't changed over the last 200 years. And that's the reality. We've seen them moving, the borders moving over and over again. So Crimea was an integral part of Russia for 200 years. I remember saying to somebody, some, mentioning to somebody, well, and they said, well, who did it belong to before that? You know, in other words, well, it was part of Russia, when well, Russia conquered it, well, shouldn't it go back to the people before that? And I said, well, okay, should it go back to the Mongols then? Well, who did it belong to before the Mongols came along? Well, it would belong to somebody else. So you can't, how far back can you turn the clock? The point is, you know, you might as well say all the people living, all the Europeans living in America should just go back to where they came from, where their descendants, to be honest. So Crimea was part of Russia for 200 years. I think that was settled. Crimea is also, as I said, where Sevastopol, Russia's only warm sea port is, and the base of its Black Sea feet. So from a strategic point of view, Crimea is extraordinarily important to Russia, incredibly important to Russia. For 300 years, it was a strategic goal of Russia to achieve and establish a warm sea port and a naval base down there. So, as I said, after Ukraine became independent, then Crimea was part of Ukraine. So there was a deal was done. Ukraine sent all its uh, nuclear weapons to Russia. And then a deal was done that the Soviet um, fleet was split into two. I don't know if it's exactly half and half. But anyway, Ukraine inherited part of the Soviet Black Sea fleet and Russia kept another part of the Soviet Black Sea fleet. And so Russia then had to lease its naval base. So it meant it, it uh, no longer owned Russia, Crimea, it had to lease it. So it took out a lease for uh, Sevastopol, I think for about 50 years or something, I forget now. 25 years. And then there was a lot of political turmoil and division. So um, somebody called Viktor Yankovich, he was elected to become the president of Ukraine in 2004. Now he was very pro-Russian and he wanted Ukraine to have closer relations with Russia. So he was elected. He was accused of being a rigged election because it, the accusation was the Russians were involved in rigging it so that he was elected. And so there was what was called the Orange Revolution where he was overthrown and the uh, Supreme Court ruled that it was a rigged election. And so there had to be new elections. And so new elections are won by Viktor Yushchenko. A lot of stuff went on there, poisoning and things like that. Well, that's a bit later on. And at this stage, then Ukraine applied to join NATO in 2008. And then there's another election a couple of years later, and this time Yankovic 
win, won the election. And he rejected the association agreement that the previous government was making with the EU, and he chose to have closer ties with Russia. And what I find interesting about this is Yankovic was elected, who wanted closer relations with Russia. Yushchenko was elected, who wanted closer relationships with the West. So from that, you can see, and then he, Yankovic was re-elected. From this, you can see that, and there's lots of other stuff went on in between. It's very corrupt and brutal kind of Ukrainian politics, to be honest. Anyway, from that, you can see Ukraine basically is divided. More or less half of Ukraine wants closer relations with Russia. More or less half of Ukraine wants closer relationships with the West, with Europe. And we can see that from the history. Half of Ukraine was very much under the Lithuanian-Polish kind of sphere, part of that, and co connected very much with Europe. Another side of Ukraine was part of Russia and under the Mongols, and then the borders are drawn a certain way. So the result is then Ukraine, you could say, it's a divided country. And it's almost like a civil war going on within Ukraine, between Ukrainian-speaking Ukrainians and Russian-speaking Ukrainians. And then on the other side, there's Russian-speaking Russians. And it's like, and maybe some Russian-speaking Ukrainians, I don't know, it's very complicated. So it's like a sort of civil war going on, to be honest. Anyway, so what happened here, there was the Euromaidan protests and Yankovic fled. And um, for Russia, I think it was a huge shock. It was a huge shock because they realized then that the possibility here of Ukraine seriously joining, leaving the Russian sphere of influence and Ukraine joining the European Union, which is not just a trade body organization or free market, it's a political, economic, and aspires to be a military organization. It also wants to join NATO and the determination to join NATO. So when Russia realized that, it thought, my God. Now Putin is religious, so he probably thought, my God. If Sebastopol becomes, if, if Ukraine joins NATO and, and the EU, this means the Crimea is then part of the European Union. The Crimea then is part of NATO. That means NATO has authority and the EU has authority over Russia's only warm sea port. And supposing <coughs> Ukraine decides to not to renew the lease on Sevastopol, then again, Russia then is driven back 300 years when it no longer has a warm sea port. It no longer has a, a window to the world for trade and for all sorts of other things. And so for Russia then, this is an existential crisis. I mean, it's a serious existential crisis, the idea that it would lose a Crimea. And so from a Russian point of view, it's perfectly understandable that it's completely unacceptable. So strategically, Russia would lose its warm, its warm sea naval base and also for trade. And, uh, and so that's why uh, I think Putin then and Russians were, were profoundly shocked. It was a huge shock because Russians had always, you know, Russians have always assumed Ukrainians are Slavs. They were part of the Russian Empire. They were part of the Soviet Union. They are connected to us by religion. They're all Orthodox. They're connected to us by by language, you know, because many of them speak Russian and Ukrainian is a separate language, but it's quite connected in many ways. And they thought it's the same culture, Kiev and Rus. You know, that's where Russia started, was in, was in Kiev. And so for Russia, the idea that Ukraine could suddenly decide it wanted to go and join the West is like a, an existential crisis, an existential shock. And it was completely, unex I would say it was completely unexpected. And so that's why Putin moved incredibly quickly to go and annex the Crimea immediately after 2014, because he realized it's just, this is just very, very shocking. Um, so while I, so just backtrack, <clears throat> so while I can understand why Russia did it, the question is, well, should it have done it? Okay, so personally, I think the Crimea was part of Russia for 200 years. I think Khrushchev did not have the right to transfer it and give it to Ukraine. 
You don't have the right to take part of someone's country and give it to another country. So that's what Khrushchev did. At the time, I said it made no difference, no, made no practical difference. So I think Crimea is part of Russia. It should never have been given to Ukraine by Khrushchev. If Khrushchev hadn't given it to Ukraine, then when the Soviet Union broke up in 1991, the Crimea would still be part of Russia. And this whole situation would not have occurred. This whole situation would not have happened. Well, a lot of it wouldn't have happened. Some of it still would. So, okay, so what I think should have happened in 1991, I think the Russians got a raw deal. I think Russia should have said, okay, we, if we're going to guarantee Ukraine's freedom and independence, then we would like to have Crimea back again. We would like to reverse what Khrushchev did. I don't think Yeltsin was on the ball. If he'd been more on the ball and a little less inebriated, maybe he would have done that. But I think, I think Russia got a bad deal, to be honest. So, okay, so the reality is, for whatever reason, um, Ukraine, Crimea remained with the Ukraine. And then what should have happened next, if Putin had been a bit wiser, what he should have done, he should have held conferences in the United Nations and he should have explained this whole situation at an international conference in the United Nations and explain actually Crimea, all the 98, I think, percent of the people living in Crimea are ethnically Russian, they speak Russian, they want to be part of Russia, they see themselves as Russian and that what Khrushchev did was illegitimate and you could say illegal or unlawful, this administrative transfer. And then Putin should have said, ask the United Nations, please, would you arrange a, tr a transfer of Crimea back to Russia through, a, through international law? And the international community, I think if they'd understood the history instead of being so ignorant, I think they would, most people would say, yeah, that's perfectly reasonable. And then, you know, Russia could have been prevailed on, Putin could have been prevailed on to make certain kind of, to reinforce the security guarantees as well. But that didn't happen. And I say, you know, Putin moved very crudely and in a very Russian way and just used force to be able to achieve its ends instead of going through a diplomatic process and going through a, a legal process. At the same time, Putin warned NATO many times over the last 15 years about the eastward expansion of NATO. And, you know, if NATO, if Ukraine joins NATO, it's going to be an existential crisis for Russia. And I would say that the West and leaders in Washington and Brussels, especially, and London, extraordinarily ignorant about Russia, about Russian history, about Russian culture, and about Russia's legitimate concerns about its historical strategic desires and needs. And uh, anyway, Putin did what he did uh, and in a very crude way. He held a referendum and yeah, the reality is most other people living in Crimea voted to join Russia. Even if they hadn't, you know, if, if, that's just because they happen to be Russians. And Solzhenitsyn himself in 19, about 1990 or, no, I think in the early 1980s, Solzhenitsyn himself talking about Ukraine, you know, he himself was partly Ukrainian. He said a lot of the people living in Ukraine, they're not Ukrainian, they're Russian. And when the Soviet Union breaks up, he said it's really important that there should be local referendum such that the Russian speaking parts of Ukraine, they can have a local vote to decide whether they want to remain in Ukraine or whether they want to join, become part of Russia. He said it's really important to have these local referenda to decide. Unfortunately, that never happened. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, so what happened next after that? Well, the reality has been a lot of mistreatment of Russian speakers in the East, the Donbass region. Uh, the Ukrainians, for various reasons, wanted to Ukrainianize them. It's like a reverse policy of Russianizing all the people in the Soviet Union. Now the Ukrainians thought, well, we need to Ukrainianize the Russian speakers living in uh, 
the eastern uh, regions uh, and you know have Russian taught uh, uh, schools education done in Russian in schools and so you know after taking seizing the Crimea Russia was involved in stirring up lots of things in Donbass about this uh, mistreatment because there definitely was mistreatment of Russian speakers in the east Putin said it was a holocaust or genocide which is a load of nonsense they weren't being killed but there was definitely a cultural a move to, you know, culturally to um, make Ukraine more homogenous in terms of language, which is never a good thing to do. So there, and then a lot of Russian speakers and, you know, a lot of problems went on then, which is still going on till today. Then Zelensky was elected in 2019, and he was very determined to join NATO. He went to a meeting with uh, Western countries, NATO countries. He determined and demanded, demanded that Ukraine should be allowed to join NATO. And uh, I think myself, Zelensky is a brilliant leader, but he was a very poor statesman. He didn't really understand geopolitics. It's not a question whether Ukraine wants to join NATO or not. The question is, is it wise to join NATO? Now, personally, I think it's very unwise for Ukraine to join NATO or to join the EU. Why? Because Ukraine is a divided country. Half the country wants to be close to Russia. The other half wants to be close to the EU. What's the solution? The solution is Ukraine should be neutral. It shouldn't be allowed to join NATO or the EU, but also it should remain neutral and not, you know, from uh, and allowed to have whatever relationship it wants to have with Russia, but not to be part of, you know, not come under Russian or Moscow domination either. It should be regarded as a neutral country. Nothing wrong with being neutral. Austria is neutral. Austria is not in NATO. Uh, Sweden and Finland weren't in NATO. Switzerland, until you know what happened with Ukraine, they felt quite comfortable not being in NATO for the last 80 years. Um, well, however many years since the Second World War. Uh, Switzerland's not in NATO. So I think personally, Ukraine should have just remained in a neutral country. But Zelensky was determined to join NATO and also Washington was encouraging uh, Ukraine to join NATO, especially Biden. He had a lot of connections with Ukraine. It'll all come out one day, and his son did as well. Uh, Trump himself was not that way, not orientated that way. Uh, just might as well talk about Trump, Trump since everyone's interested in him. Anyway, so the general, the general trend the last 20 years has been very anti-Russian. A lot of the anti-Soviet feeling in America became anti-Russian. The reality is the great experts on the Soviet, the great American and British experts on the Soviet Union, all of them, without exception, said it, NATO, that uh, NATO should not expand east because it'll upset Russia. Certainly, Ukraine should not become encouraged to become a part of NATO. So all the scholars, they recognize it's a huge mistake. But the politicians, for various reasons, they said anybody who wants to join NATO should be allowed to join NATO. If Ukraine wants to join NATO, they should be allowed to join NATO. But that's not wise. You know, if you understand Russia and the Russian mentality and history, you realize that's stupid. Incredibly stupid. Never mind being incredibly arrogant. Anyway, so Trump then, when Trump comes along, he wants to change the policy, which was the policy of Obama and his predecessors to try to, uh, which is very anti-Russian, expanding NATO to the East. So Trump then was very, I think was quite wise. Trump realized the main problem is not Russia. The main problem is China. So Obama was orientated towards, and Clinton especially, orientated very much towards uh, China. Anyway, so Trump said, actually, China is a real long-term foe. And finally, everybody's waking up to realize that today. But Trump was the first person who said that. And Trump wanted to draw Russia back into the Western camp. Now, the great wisdom of Richard Nixon was he realized the Soviet Union and China, two great communist powers, were united together. He realized we, he needed to split the Soviet Union and China. He couldn't wasn't able to communicate with Moscow because they didn't want to communicate. So Nixon went to Beijing. He spoke to Chairman Mao. He showed Chairman Mao that the Soviet Union had missiles in the Far East, which were pointed towards China. 
Chairman Mao didn't know that. He was shocked. And then the relationship between China and the Soviet Union cooled down considerably. This is the 1970s, I can't remember exactly when now. And then as a result of that, Moscow got a shock because it felt, oh, maybe China is going to become an ally with us, with America against us. And then Russia then, and the Soviet Union then invited Nixon to go to Moscow. And then that led to <clears throat> the arms reduction talks, uh, which were initiated by Nixon to reduce the number of nuclear weapons and all sorts of things in the beginning of the rapprochement and the sol solution to the Cold War. But the main point was Nixon realized you have to divide the Soviet Union and China. What the West has been doing has been driving Russia back into the arms of China. Trump realized that was a mistake, and he was trying to draw Russia back into the Western camp, which was the vision of Reagan and Thatcher and Cole and Mitterrand, that Russia as a European country should be part of this partnership for peace within Europe. But the later Western leaders that came after that were stupid and ignorant and arrogant and very anti-Russian. Uh, so Trump was, I think Trump was trying to reverse that. And that's why he got attacked so much. Uh, you know, he's accused of being, anyway, all kinds of Russia, Russian stuff going on there. He was accused of being know, an agent of Russia. So the left and the Democrats who anyway, destroyed him. Anyway, so I think Trump had a, Trump, you know, even though personally, I don't think he's a very attractive personality in many different ways. In terms of foreign policy, he was very, very clear and very good in his decisions. In the Middle East, the Abraham Accords, he met with Kim Il, you know, met with this Korean, North Korean chat, didn't go very far. And he also understood really well about where Russia should be located in the Western camp. Anyway, so as I said, there was a big shock at, uh, and Zelensky didn't understand this. You know, he just didn't understand the sort of bigger picture, to be honest. And then uh, there was a huge shock in Russia. The U Ukrainian Orthodox Church became autocephalous. So Kiev was the birthplace of orthodoxy, Russian orthodoxy. Uh, the head of the Russian Orthodox, of the Russian Orthodox Church was in Kiev. But then later on, uh, I think under Ivan III, it was transferred, the seat of the Russian Orthodox Church was transferred to Moscow. But still, it was all the same church. And so right up until 2019, the, the Orthodox in Ukraine fell under the authority of the Russian Patriarchate. But then, for various reasons, Ukraine, some Ukrainians, a lot of Ukrainians, uh, sponsored also and encouraged by Americans, uh, wanted to have their own national Orthodox Church, which is independent of Moscow. And they achieved this in 2019 um, with the authority of the Patriarchate in Constantinople and the other Eastern Orthodox Patriarchs. They gave uh, Ukraine the authority to have its own independent, um, what's it called, autocephalous uh, Patriarchate. And this was a huge shock for Russia because this meant, because for Russia thought, we're well, all part of the same church the same community, the same spiritual community. And that was a big shock, because I said Kiev is the birthplace of Russian Orthodoxy. And then there's this vision that um, various Russian Slavophiles had of a united Orthodox Russian world. This idea going throwback to the th Russia's the Third Rome, which I talked about briefly, and quite extensively, I talked about Russian history. So Ukraine then becoming independent and joining the West is breaking up this vision of a united Orthodox Russian world. And so it's, an, it's like a, a cultural, existential, religious crisis for Russians. It's really, you know, very, very, very deep, actually, what's going on here. It's not just politics, it's just it's military or defense. Anyway, so you've got all this stuff here going on about, you know, denazification and um, demilitarization. Ukraine was never a military threat to Russia. You know, never a military threat to Russia. No aspirational desire of Ukraine ever to invade Russia. Ukraine's not run by Nazis. I mean, Zelensky himself is a Jew. Yeah, uh, it's just uh, so if you uh, not Nazi, just a word you 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 label your enemies as being Nazis. There's no way that uh, Ukrainians are Nazis. 
during the Second World War, it's true that some Ukrainians in the west of Ukraine, uh, Western lands, did um, join together with the Germans uh, because they thought this is the way in which they could, uh, you know, after the bad experience they had with Holdemar, they thought this is the way to get independence. And so they fought together with Germans against the Soviet Union. That's definitely true. When they realized the Germans, Nazis, were no better than the, the Soviets, and they uh, started, turned around and started fighting against the, the Germans. So this is just a pretext, denazification, demilitarization. Based, and then the other excuse is to stop Ukraine adopting Western culture, LGBTQ+, plus, also to defend Russian, to defend traditional marriage and families. Another, you know, excuse that uh, Putin gives. But to be honest, you know, I'm not a great, I'm not a fan of uh, LGBTQ and that. But you know, if you're concerned about that. Are you going to solve the problem of LGBTQ plus using tanks and guns? Is that the solution? Or is the solution, if you're really concerned about this as an issue, you should send in missionaries. You should send in people to engage in an argument. You should send, you should support education and textbooks and all these sorts of things in the schools to combat this kind of Western culture. You can't do that with tanks. Uh, and you certainly can't defend traditional marriage and family with tanks. Instead, it's been a huge shock because, you know, there are, I don't know, maybe a million, I don't know, hundreds of thousands anyway of Ukrainian Russian marriages. Now they're called mixed marriages, but then they weren't thought of as being mixed marriages. It was just Ukrainians and Russians freely got married to each other. But now, as a result of what's going on now, it's been a huge tension on people who have. Half the family comes from one from Ukraine, and half the family comes from Russia. It's put huge stress upon so many people's marriages and families and relationships. It's been devastatingly tragic. So again, what's the solution here? Well, you know, you can't do it with guns. You have to do it by, uh, or by either with guns or by forcing people to adopt your language. Solzhenitsyn said in the early 1980s, you know, in Ukraine, when it becomes independent and the Soviet Union breaks up, Ukraine should have a series of mini small local referenda, referendums or referenda where the local people can decide if they want to remain in Ukraine or if they want to um, be in Russia.